Thank you for viewing this video to prepare for day two of the Hub's second annual symposium. Along with brief bookends, the video contains two keynote presentations, each just under 40 minutes. This is the only pre-recording for the symposium. We posted it well in advance so you could view at your convenience. Links for keynote speaker biographies are below the video. The Hub is so pleased that Dr. Carol Hopkins from the Thunderbird Partnership Foundation and Dr. Kwame McKenzie from the Wellesley Institute and University of Toronto chose to accept our invitation. Their job is to provide perspective and ideas for helping mental health promotion flourish in Canada, the central theme of the symposium. Both speakers draw on extensive experience. For Carol, that includes leading contributions to national policy frameworks for Indigenous wellness and substance use, as well as effective use of two-eyed seeing. Kwam's emphasis is on health equity, including in the development of social policy and health systems, and including in response to the pandemic. The order of presentations is Carol, then Kwam. I return at the end with brief instructions for submitting questions for the live, online dialogue with them and three other panelists. We went about show no gem and dish nakas gaye maying gana do dem lane lanape kwe and dao lanape a king and donjava. I'm Carol Hopkins and I come from the Delaware Nation. Uh, the Delaware Nation is originally known as the Lenape people. We're located in southwestern Ontario. And uh, my mother is from the Delaware Nation at Moravian Town, and that's where I'm joining you from. The community is also host to the head office of Thunderbird Partnership Foundation, where I am the CEO. And I'd like to talk to you about uh, health promotion um, for children and youth from in a, a First Nations uh, lens using culture as the foundation. And I'm gonna share a presentation with you um, to speak from. I'm gonna be talking about uh, promoting wellness for First Nations children and youth. And I'm gonna start from the foundation of the First Nations Mental Wellness Continuum Framework. It has five key themes, was developed in conversation with First Nations across the country. And it conveys uh, the importance of culture as the foundation. So in this environment where we're talking about reconciliation and understanding um, our roles and responsibilities for implementing the calls to action, um, TRC calls to action, there's a lot of conversation about First Nations or Indigenous people's knowledge, culture, and practices. So we're talking in the space of health promotion this framework is also uh, critically important and relevant. And the one key thing that I want to convey in the presentation today is based on culture as the foundation. And so when we talk about culture as the foundation, it requires a paradigm shift, a different way of thinking, because currently or historically, we have been working with First Nations populations from understanding um, the deficits, the problems, the challenges, and our concerns for how do we facilitate, what's my role in engaging in supporting their health and their wellness. But it's always starting from that problem base. And, and then we're working to discover, um, hopefully we're working to discover what are the strengths that are present in the uh, families and the communities of First Nations peoples. But what this, uh, mental wellness continuum framework is talking about is that we have to move from that place of starting on what's the problem and and then trying to fix the problem and through that process discovering strengths almost as if it's accidental we have to start from the place of what is the strengths that we can draw on that sets the foundation and in the framework that culture is the foundation uh, theme is the discovery of strengths and that if we are working from the, uh, the foundation of culture uh, to try and understand that culture and what it translates into practice for promoting health and wellness, then we're also working from um, the shift from excluding indigenous worldview, value and culture, and we're practicing um, how do we understand indigenous knowledge and how does that set the foundation for evidence 
uh, because we all want to ensure that what we are investing in is actually going to make a difference. But and for First Nations people across the country, when they were developing this framework, they were saying, we know our culture and our knowledge makes a difference. And we have to start using that rather than always converting or adapting or modifying Western-based theories and practices. That can be many, meaningful and have been meaningful um, in making a difference, but they haven't, our elders have said, those practices alone never take us far enough in making a difference. So I'm gonna to talk to you about that. And then when we are thinking, the great thing about health promotion is it automatically shifts our focus from just fit, focusing on individuals to thinking about families and communities. And in this sense, we're talking about shifting as we're thinking about families and communities, what outcomes of our investments or efforts are making for whole of families and whole of community. And then moving from the uncoordinated and fragmented efforts and services to looking at integra integrated and sustainable models. And so the culture is foundation. We have to first understand what is indigenous knowledge? What do we mean by that? And for First Nations people, it's important to know that their knowledge is sourced from the great spirit, our stories of creation talk about the ongoing relationship um, that, uh, and in that story of creation, the great spirit is talked about as ensuring an ongoing relationship and ensuring that anything and everything that we'd, we would need to live life forever and all time across generations and um, of people on this earth have been thought of, thought of in that beginning time. And there was a way to actualize those answers in physical reality from spirit reality to physical reality. And so in physical reality, then we have access to that source knowledge through our teachings of creation that are held in our sacred records and writing that we find in sacred societies and translated through our original languages and culture-based practices. Now, stories, uh, when I talk about the creation story, it sometimes puts our mind in, um, in the realm of not evidence, uh, not quality, it's a story. Our, our written records, um, our writing and our records is also not in the same format that we understand writing and records. Um, that contain evidence of quality. Our writing and our records are in different formats, birch bark scrolls, um, uh, pictographs, um, and symbols. And there are very few people who can read those records in that writing. But those people have been trained um, across generations to understand that and understand the, the language um, that holds that knowledge but they say that knowledge is, is not valuable if we do not translate it into everyday life. And so that's um, um, conveyed through the creation stories. And our stories say that every creation story is true. That's different than how we understand Western-based evidence or conventional evidence, where it's always open to question and to revalidating and to retesting. And the stories of creation are different across the language groups of, of First Nations people across the country, but there's no debate about which stories are true and um, they all have common elements. So the belief is that our culture and our evidence is visible through our language structures and that also convey our language structures are spirit-based. Um, and because the spirit is, a cent is, is central to all of life, the great spirit is central to all of life, the spirit influences all of life. And so um, just some quick examples of that, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, is our original language for the land and all of creation on the land and below the land in the sky realm and in the universe, including human beings, that were created by the great spirit are all invested with spirit. And so all are related. And um, 
it's an important to have relationship um, with, with our relatives in creation. So what does that have to do with health promotion? Well, we know health promotion, prevention and education is about knowledge and skills, creating a, awareness and, and to help facilitate um, healthy, healthy lifestyles, uh, creating the conditions to support those lifestyles, um, doing what we can to reduce the occurrence of harmful behaviors so that we have supportive family relationships. So from a, a culture-based lens, again, drawing from that indigenous knowledge, it's critical to increase knowledge and skills for living life well as an individual, family, and community. But what informs that healthy lifestyle? What are, what are the model, models and the theories and the practices that support a healthy lifestyle for families and communities? We have to start there first, is what knowledge are we drawing on? And when we look at the mental wellness continuum framework, culture as a foundation, we have to spend time in conversation with First Nations people to understand their culture and their worldview. In addition, we have to ensure that our efforts are um, towards increasing and supporting mental wellness equity. So it's not having those conversations so that we can take it away and then go and develop something on our own and then uh, assume that we can offer that service for uh, First Nations people. And a lot of people are using the word of co-management or co-development or two-eyed seeing. And culture as a foundation means that we're not just having a one-time conversation and extracting knowledge from uh, or uh, bits and pieces from that conversation to develop um, a tool, a process, a program um, that promotes wellness. It's about an ongoing investment in that culture and that knowledge um, to facilitate equity. And, and together then that increases um, protective factors at the same time decreases risk factors. And we become aware of those as we move along in the attempts to apply culture. And we also have to understand that health promotion um, cannot be achieved um, if policies and actions do not have an understanding of the determinants of health for First Nations. And so, you know, under, you know, using that deficit based lens, it's like, okay, so what is it that's preventing the health promotion? We can't ignore that but we have to ensure that that isn't our only focus and, and that we're not just going down that rabbit hole focused on um, all of those issues, but it being informed um, to ensure that our efforts are not placing the burden solely on First Nations people as though they are the cause, so-called cause of, of the issues that they face. So, um, we have a, a life expectancy that's 10 to 15 years lower than national Canadian average. There's preventable chronic diseases and transgenerational trauma that is resulting from colonial policies. And we think often of colonial policies as being something of the past, but we can't afford to fool ourselves and give us that false sense of comfort because colonial policies today also exist. And their policies that assume that culture doesn't matter, indigenous knowledge doesn't matter, that our sources of evidence are not quality, and that we have to, um, you know, figure out a way to work around that. Um, and so those, those things lead to, um, and we have experienced the criminalization of our own language and ceremony and culture, um, and removal from our lands. Uh, today, we, we experience that through uh, floods and fires and uh, environmental disasters. We are being removed from our lands. And um, our language use is, uh, we have a new language act in Canada, but we're still trying to figure out how um, do, do we support language in policy and in program. Um, and separating children from their families. It was once the residential school, now it's, it's child welfare. Um, infant mortality rates, two to three times higher without, with the absence of our cultural practices or the investment in 
um, in, in our own practices around birthing and taking care of uh, life coming into the world, we have uh, seen infant mortality rates higher. And then our disconnection from land has led to diabetes. Um, we're twice as likely to die from uh, avoidable causes and more likely to end up in child welfare and less likely to graduate high school. And so this is the current landscape. So what are we gonna do differently? We have to take bold action to ensure a different course and that's health promotion. If that's not where we want to go, then what are we gonna do that lands us someplace different? Well, um, Janet Smiley and colleagues did uh, a systematic review looking at um, what creates the uh, good environment and evidence for investing in um, infant toddler uh, health promotion, pre prenatal and infant um, toddler health promotion in Canada. And they found uh, certain characteristics that produce results in health promotion. And those are local indigenous community investment. That's the same thing that the mental wellness uh, continuum framework talks about um, community ownership, um, uh, develop, uh, community program development. And where there are community perceptions that the program is, is intrinsic, meaning that is owned by the community because they have invested their own knowledge and cultural practices. And that there's high levels of sustained community participation when it's developed by the community for the community and where there is leadership to ensure that the program is sustained. And the difference it makes is, is seen um, in, from, the, from the literature review um, in birth outcomes, uh, infant, more, um, infant mortality rates um, have changed, access to pre and postnatal care, um, having an impact in prenatal street drug use, um, increased um, breastfeeding, dental health, infant more nutrition, child development, and exposure to lang language and culture, all of these things make a difference. And they have, and they've seen in the literature where um, there is good evidence uh, to, to demonstrate that. So we, the conclusion that the authors make in this study is that we have to um, uh, demonstrate important pathways to success. And now this study is about the beginning of the life um, lifespan, and so and so I'm saying for health promotion, if we're not clear what anchors um, our health and wellness, our mental wellness, at the very beginning of life, then our investments um, a little bit at a time across the lifespan do make a difference. But we have to understand the foundation. Culture is the foundation. And so um, here are some questions we asked in another research study, and I think are important questions um, for what you can do as you approach health promotion initiatives with First Nations people. And the question is, what is, what is a whole and healthy person from your lens, from your knowledge of your culture and community? What is a whole and healthy person? And most often people say, or answer that question by a definition of, of what is not. And so they'll say, well, there's less diabetes or there's less substance use. And that's not um, a good definition of what is a whole and healthy person. That is another conversation that is the uh, talking about the absence of disease. And, and so we have to help facilitate a shift um, in that that paradigm shift I talked about earlier and start from, again, what is, is culture in the community and what does it tell us about what is a whole and healthy person and how does our culture facilitate wellness? So when we practice those uh, culture or uh, culture practices and interventions to promote wellness, or we invest in, in understanding indigenous knowledge and where that comes from, um, what our language holds um, in 
for informing our perspectives of wellness, what should we expect those outcomes to be? So what is a health, whole and healthy person from your culture, from your language? What does your language communicate about that whole and healthy person? And how do we practice culture to facilitate wellness? Now, it's not that things, it's not only culture, is not only about the things that we do. Culture is understood as a way of life. And so that expands um, our, our thinking and our understanding about what are those ways of life and fits well with, with health promotion or mental wellness promotion that facilitate wellness. It takes us and expands our perspective to family within community and community on the land, the community within nationhood and their identity. And so when we ask those questions in a, in a research uh, study that uh, was called Culture as Intervention, um, honoring our strengths, learning about culture as intervention, we, that conversation um, across Canada, across language groups, across cultural practices, and it was only focused on um, that culture as evidence, culture as foundation. What we found is that um, there are 13 different indicators that tell us something about wellness. The whole and healthy person is attending to mind, body, emotions, and spirit. And, and that going back to that indigenous knowledge perspective, spirit is central. And, um, and that when we invest in spiritual behavior, we're attending to learning about the values of the people and their belief systems and worldview and how they identify themselves and what that identity means to them. Um, it creates a sense of hope because it's grounded in their worldview and lifts up that identity rather than trying to erase it. And emotional behavior, emotional wellness is facilitated by relationships with family, community, and all of creation. And when we have those things in place, it facilitates an attitude towards living life rather than in a place of despair where the determinants of health around us um, are barely seen as um, equitable or supporting um, our wellness and our, and our overall health. And when we get to those places of despair, that's when we, we find high risk for choosing to step out of this life and otherwise known as um, premature and unnatural death or suicide. And mental wellness is taking our spirit-based knowledge that intuition because we have a spirit and that spirit is always influencing our thoughts and our feelings in, in relationship with the spirit around us. And, and so we're taught when we have access to this knowledge and it's supported in the environment around us, um, we, we use the English word of intuition. Um, and, and then we're matching that with um, the physical reality, education and learning experience. And together those two inform a fuller understanding about my life has meaning. And finally then understanding my life has purpose and understanding physical wellness is about ensuring that we are facilitating the unique ways of being and doing of First Nations people. And when all of those things are in place, it creates wholeness. And so we created an, uh, an assessment to measure um, the impact of culture on achieving those outcomes. And you can find that on our website. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you in a minute about those results that we've achieved. But earlier I said that sacred knowledge has to be in, in translated into indigenous knowledge through language and cultural practices. Peter Ochis was a great elder and he talked about um, the stages of life, but what he was talking about is the spirit journey through the stages of life across the lifespan. And that teaching was all about facilitating um, cultural practices and an environment that would support the spirit journey and those spirit openings that happen at different stages of life that are critical to our wellness. And so 
I said earlier, language is the foundation to health promotion. So I'm going to start giving you some examples now that I've done. I I think I've introduced a foundation of, of a way of thinking about approaching health promotion. So our language is uh, the Ojibwe language. It has a term called manadominus. And, and that concept is a, as a whole concept. There's, you can literally translate manado as spirit and menace and the contemporary interpretation is beads, but that has much more meaning um, than spirit beads. What does that mean? And and originally, it was our way of communicating an understanding about physical and spiritual life together, and and the seeds of life, and the way they're strung together by the great spirit, and. Um, and so those spirit seeds um, translate into an understanding of our DNA. Um, and so those spirit seeds are strung together um, physically and spiritually that make up our unique identity. And from that comes our understanding of our nationhood, our name, our language, as well as our personality, characteristics, strengths, gifts, and our connection to creation. It's all held within the link, just in that one concept. And so if we understand, uh, if we take time to invest in understanding how our language can inform our way of thinking um, and an approach to health promotion, then we have an understanding about what will facilitate those different outcomes than uh, we talked about earlier. And so here's another example about how that was translated into, into practice. And so the way that the, this uh, Tikkanagan and this moss bag are held together um, is not given much priority. It's the dressing up, the beadwork, and, and we say, oh, wow, that looks beautiful. All of it has meaning. And the meaning of it is the dressing up and the symbols represent um, a culture, a nation, and their way of communicating. And so our written records was, uh, were in, bead, in beadwork patterns um, that translate uh, uh, an understanding about identity. And what was understood is that the environment around us, the community, our relationship with creation and the land um, is, is critically important. And so in the way that we took care of our, our, our newborn babies was that we dressed them up so that their identity was seen and was visible from the very beginning. And so the beadwork might represent their spirit name. It might re represent their, their uh, something, well, it does represent something about their culture, but it also might communicate something about their clan. Um, and and then the lacing, the lacing represents that DNA string. And from a First Nations perspective, um, Manado Maness is not only the physical DNA, but the spiritual DNA. And the understanding that everyone in the environment around this newborn baby is responsible for dressing up the spirit to ensure uh, a good life and life to the fullest. And so this is a picture of my grandson and uh, he tried really hard to come into the world early and he was very successful. He came in 10 weeks early. And so there was a lot of concern about, you know, his life and would he, would he be able to make that journey um, into this world safely and live. And so there was lots of ceremony and cultural practices um, to petition the spirit for uh, that support to his clan to um, and his family and community around him that came to support his mom when she was in hospital waiting for, you know, hoping to, uh, to, to have him in her womb as long as possible. And, and then when he was finally able, he made it obviously, he, and when he finally was able to come home, then it was important to connect him to creation and to say thank you um, that he has arrived now that doesn't leave out the Western medicine and the great hospital that ensured they did their part in supporting my daughter and, uh, and my grandson 
and and his father and making sure that he arrived but it was both sides and the western knowledge medical knowledge and um, our cultural sacred knowledge that ensured his arrival when he came home then it was touching his feet to the earth for the first time and and so when we lowered his feet there's lots of meaning in the lowering of the feet uh, lowering to touch the earth and it represents um, a portion of our understanding of our story of creation when he touched the earth his feet um, and his uh, reflexes automatically pulled his feet back now i've cropped this picture and what you don't see around him is all of his cousins and extended family who came then and gently put their feet their hands on him to help him touch the earth and now you can see in this picture he's his mom has lowered him to the earth and he's comfortable but it was with that support of family and community that also ensured his life the promotion of his life that he was able to achieve and live life and so on this take a noggin um, it's laced up a little bit differently but the the dressing on it represents his clan so indigenous culture is what has sustained us as a people. It didn't disappear. Our language didn't disappear. Our knowledge did not disappear. And thank goodness that the, we had our ancestors who found ways to ensure it for the future in very practical ways, uh, you know, um, practicing our culture um, in ways that would not were, um, out on the land where they would not be seen and um, our children would not be confiscated or whether it was hiding those sacred records um, in the land and um, all of those efforts as well as their prayer and their beliefs ensured something for the future but um, in Maslow's study when he was uh, studying uh, Blackfoot people and and from that study um, he developed his uh, his theory on the or his model on the hierarchy of of needs he found that the settler nations around blackfoot communities had further uh, far more psychological distress than the blackfoot people and when he studied that um, it's represented in this picture and that child is smiling and um, it was at Hat he his study um, understood that relationship with uh, his mother, with the community around him, but also how they cared for him ensured that um, that baby was content. Again, setting the foundation for health and promoting health. So that was criminalized, but yet today we have these mechanisms that. Um, and you can uh, showing the picture of another baby smiling that attachment these mechanisms the child carrier it, it's convenient it's for convenience but it also facilitates attachment and so we have to think about how our cultural practices are reflected in reality today um, as first nations people but our partners and our allies also have to understand that we had these practices and they have not disappeared and they're still relevant today. So um, I'm going to uh, move on to understanding youth then. So um, our cultural practices at the at the youth stage of life, and again, this goes across cultural diversity, but the is fasting and, and fasting is about igniting those spirit seeds again across the lifespan there are across the stages of life it, there are critically important um, teachings and practices that are about attending to the spirit and so at the adolescent stage of life if you look up anything on the internet or have un understood anything about culture through your conversations um, around youth and adolescence there's a lot written about the rites of passage and the rites of passage have to do with becoming a woman for the first time or becoming a man. And there are significant markers of that change, that physical change, but also the spiritual change. And so it's about igniting that, that spirit and, and developing, um, feeding the spirit. And so fasting does that. 
And in practical ways, it helps us to manage our fear of the unknown because you're out on the land in isolation for a period of time. And you're there day and maybe overnight. And so if you think about um, a teenager, maybe they're a little bit um, better able to manage the dark, but you don't just start fasting at the adolescent stage. You begin with teaching and preparation so that they, when they get to that adolescent stage of life, they know how to manage their fears of the unknown. They know how to manage their emotions. Now, this is a significant issue for, for many um, issue. I mean, it's a learning opportunity and it's a challenge because we're, we're trying to develop that emotional intelligence and emotional regulation. And that's what fasting does. It also teaches delayed gratification because you're fasting for a reason, for something. So you're petitioning your spirit family, all of creation, the great spirit, to have to help you to see and understand more about your purpose in life. And that's the vision, to have that vision about what is, what is the meaning and purpose? How do I fulfill that? And then the social responsibility is that you're not doing that in isolation, you're doing that with family and community. And so that's one example of a cultural practice, practice that prepares and then uh, facilitates an understanding about one's purpose and meaning and, and connection and relationship to family and community. And so without that, without those, that foundation of culture that promotes uh, wellness, promotes health, then we have a loss across the stages of life that then just continue to accumulate. And so before birth, um, we know intergenerational trauma is transferred from generation to generation, and, but, and so is addiction. So pre-birth, we have the presence of that trauma and addiction and, and the impact on, on the unborn. And then where they're born, when they're born, um, we know through the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal that focused on child welfare, that child welfare plays a key role and so when the children are born, they're more likely to be picked up by child welfare. And that interrupts um, the production of oxytocin that facilitates bonding and attachment. And, but it also, uh, you know, it creates those neurological disorders that we uh, see in um, Autism, for example, uh, Asperger's, those kinds of um, conditions are not just genetic, they're environmental. And at the adolescent stage of life, the, uh, the, that appearance of trauma, it, it manifests in behavior. And um, the underlying uh, trauma experience that continues to happen is sexual abuse. And then when we get to that young adult stage, instead of wondering and wandering around trying to figure out how do I fulfill my purpose and meaning in life, people are not able to find answers to that. And then they're stepping, choosing to step out of this life. And then we, when we get to that stage of I've, I've wandered and I wondered about life and how to fulfill the meaning and purpose of my life. And now I understand the truth of that, what I'm going to take from this world around me and what I'm going to bring along from my family and my culture. There's a lack of education because our environment around us and our relationship with Canada has, has worked to erode that connection. And so the truth of our life is interpreted as I'm in the situation where I have all of these deficits and that must be because I'm First Nations. And so we in internalize that oppression and on it goes. We have opportunity to change that. We live in an environment in Canada that is one of promoting reconciliation, promoting an understanding of First Nations and promoting an understanding about our rights. Uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous pe People speak to 
the right to practice health and wellness from our own culture and our own knowledge. And so I thank you for the opportunity to share with you today. Hopefully I've given you a foundation of understanding culture as the foundation um, and how that is realized in our practices that work to promote health and wellness. Jimmy Gwich. Hi, my name is Dr. Quam McKenzie. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about building a better pandemic response by filling in the gaps. And I like the idea of filling in the gaps because I was brought up in London, England. And if you're on the subway, which they call the tube in London, in England, when you're getting on or off the tube, it, people say it sometimes say, shout, mind the gap. This is over the tannoy, they say, mind the gap. And the reason why they say that is because there's sometimes a gap between the train and the platform, and people fall down the gap between the plane and the train and the platform. About 300 people a year do that. Um, and I started to try to think, well, what, why is there a gap? Well, there's a gap because sometimes, and you can see on this, um, on this image, uh, that some of the uh, train stations, the actual platforms are curved. And so if you've got a curved platform and you've got a straight train, some parts of the train, some parts of the carriage are further away from the platform. That's why you have the gap. Now, there are loads of things you can do. There are actually loads of strategies for filling in the gap. Say, for instance, you could straighten those platforms. Uh, but the tube, the London under, Underground, decides that's not what it's going to do. Instead, it's going to transfer the responsibility to the individual by saying, mind the gap. And so it's your responsibility to uh, make up for what is a, um, an actual structural issue with the tube. And I wanted to use this idea of these structural problems which we really should deal with with structural policy rather than individual responsibility to think through some of the things that are happening in the pandemic, some of the gaps we have in our policy uh, making, some of the gaps we have in our strategies. And so today I'm going to talk about four things really. Talk quickly about COVID in Canada, then talk about the first gap, which is about implementing pandemic equity strategies. Then I'm going to talk about mental health and COVID, and I'm going to follow that by talking about a gap which I think is important, which is the need for mental, a mental health promotion strategy uh, for COVID-19. So COVID in Canada. You will know that there have been about 3 million cases to date uh, at the time of uh, this recording. There have been nearly 34,000 deaths and there are 150,000 plus cases of long COVID. Difficult to get the numbers, 150,000 is probably the minimum. And you'll see on the other side of this slide uh, that there's significant variation in reported uh, COVID death rates per 100,000 uh, for the different provinces and also uh, on, for, on uh, reserve First Nations. So very, very different. Now, we don't know how much of this is uh, differences in reporting and differences in counting, but we do know that at the moment there are reported differences. And one of the reasons we sort of expect reported differences is we know that for every illness, there are uh, different determinants of health which act differently on different people and different population groups. So this slide is from the Canadian Medical Association and they did a piece of work called What Makes Us Sick? And what they tried to do is they tried to quantify the proportion of illness that was caused 
by different things. And they came to the conclusion that 50% of what makes us sick and 50% of what stops us getting better is our lives. So income, early childhood development, disability, education, uh, being a member of the indigenous population, your race, employment and working conditions, uh, your food, safe and nutritious food, housing and community belonging. So 50% of what makes us sick is our life. 25% is our access to healthcare and our healthcare systems and wait times. 10% uh, is our environment, air quality and civic infrastructure. And then 15% is physical, our biology, our genetics. So 85%, 50% of your life, 25% your healthcare, 10% your environment, 85% or what people would call social determinants of health. And of course, in a pandemic, social determinants of health are even more important because our public health becomes even more important. And those social determinants interact with COVID-19 uh, to make greater impacts in certain populations. Uh, so uh, the older people, and you'll say, well, no, 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 that's physical, or population for pre-existing health conditions say, no, no, that's physical. But actually, it's been demonstrated that we can significantly decrease the risk of death in older people or people with pre-existing health conditions by good public health. So yes, there's a physical component, but the excess deaths are significantly due to uh, as social determinants, as they are in ethnic minorities, homeless populations, institutional settings, and specific working environments. So it's really important to think of, there's the difference between risk and what happens, and your risk uh, of an illness might be due to your, um, physical, your frailty or pre-existing conditions, but whether you that leads to uh, death, uh, you or even contracting COVID, uh, depends on a lot of um, what happens in the public health realm. Uh, and now I'm going to have two slides just to indicate how different things can be. So these are two slides, one from uh, one from Ontario and then one that's from Toronto. And this is just showing the impacts of COVID-19 in Ontario for different racial and ethnic groups. And these are age standards, as stated, standardized per capita rates of infection and uh, severe outcomes um, from June uh, 2020 to April 2021. And uh, Ontario had collected individual level uh, race data, so it was able to do these uh, calculations. And what you see here are four different outcomes, whether you're a case of COVID, whether you're hospitalized for COVID, ICU admissions for COVID and fatality from COVID. And it looks very complex, but really these are here just to show you one thing. At the bottom of each one of those bar charts is the uh, rate of um, infection or the rate of the outcome for the white population. And it's significantly smaller than uh, the risk and rates for all of the other um, for all of the other racial groups, racial and ethnic groups. And so there's huge variation uh, between the white population and uh, different racialized groups, but then also between racialized groups, just showing how there are these differential impacts of COVID. And this is looking at hospitalization for COVID based on household income. And what you see to the left is that uh, if you're a household living in poverty, less than $30,000 is a household income annually. Um, you have much higher rates of uh, hospitalization compared to uh, the average. Uh, whereas if, you, uh, in a popular, if you're in a household where you've got 150,000 uh, dollars or more as an income, you have much lower uh, rates of COVID-19 hospitalization. And actually, the people who live in poverty are over 12 times more likely 
to be hospitalised with COVID than people who earn uh, who are in a household where uh, they have one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or more. So we've got significant inequities in COVID uh, by a number of different measures uh, which are due to the social determinants of health. But we also have strategies to deal with them. So this is one that was produced by the Public Health Agency of Canada and it was sitting in the uh, Theresa Tan's, one of Theresa Tan's reports, and it is a model for producing pandemic equity. And what this model says, it looks very complex, but really what it says is if you've got the COVID-19 pandemic and you want equity, you can improve the crisis response, which is uh, the blue box, and you can increase uh, the social determinants of health and the functioning of our health and social care system and government, uh, which is what you've got in the big orange box. So they're saying for the pandemic response, in order to move towards equity, uh, you can innovate. So rapid innovations of existing systems, or you can produce new public health actions. But in order for those things to lead to equity, you also need to focus on economic and social security and employment conditions. You need to look at stable housing. You need to look at health uh, care and the social service system and education systems, and you have to produce equity uh, and environmental stability. So all of these things need to happen to get pandemic equity. And it sounds complex and it sounds theoretical. And so what I wanted to show you is an example of where somebody tried to do it. And this is in Toronto. And Toronto had collected individual level data and they were able to show that some uh, communities and some uh, racialized groups had much higher rates of COVID than others. And so they went to racialized groups in summer of 2020 and said, well, what can we do to make our pandemic response better? And racialized groups came up with uh, three things. First, improve the public health response. Second, here are some actions on the social determinants of health that would help. And third, they wanted culturally appropriate multilingual counselling to decrease the tension in, uh, that there are, is in households. And so when they were talking about community uh, appropriate public health responses, they talked about community-based multilingual public health campaigns. They talked about community-based testing and uh, pop-up testing. They asked for free masks and sanitizer, and because overcrowding was a problem so that people couldn't social distance, socially distance, they were looking for free voluntary isolation sites. But they thought that that was not sufficient and they actually needed action on the social determinants of health. And the sorts of social determinants of health they wanted action on was uh, on eviction prevention, on food security, on emergency childcare, and on giving access, digital access, because everything was going online. And so this is what they asked for. And this is the response that uh, Toronto started bit by bit to build with community health centers and with communities and with volunteers, and also with some provincial money. And this was the outcome. So what you've got here, is you've got rate ratios of COVID-19 between June and December 2020. So these are the rates of COVID-19 compared to the white population. So they're actually measuring inequity uh, for, four, for four groups here. And so we're looking at the Latin American origin uh, group in Toronto, the black population, the Southeast Asian and the South Asian. And so if we just follow, say, for instance, the black population, which is the second 
uh, line down. You can see that in June, the rate of COVID was six times the white population. By July, it was eight times the white population. And in August, it was nine times the white population, which is when a number of these community-based equity-driven uh, 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 policies uh, started being uh, started. And then you can see the rates come down and down and down and down until you get to December, when the rates are twice that of the white population. So at their height in August, nine times, by the time you get to December, twice that of the white population. And still inequities, still inequities in place, but inequities have decreased. And in fact, if you look at all of those populations, the level of inequity, the rate ratio compared to the white population was lower in December 2020 than it was in June 2020 sort of indicating that something was going on and maybe this uh, equity uh, focused community driven strategies were actually efficacious they were actually decreasing inequities and that's what it seems was happening however though it's been we've been able to show in these data and in other places in the world that you can decrease in equity, in inequities. There is no jurisdiction that has a properly funded, right-sized, equity-based pandemic strategy. And because of that, because we haven't implemented uh, proper equity-based strategies, properly resourced, properly, proper comprehensive strategies, we continue to have bigger inequities in COVID-19 in Canada and in various jurisdictions in Canada than we need to. Let's talk about mental health. So everybody will tell you that there's an echo pandemic, uh, some people call it, of uh, mental health problems in COVID. And that's because COVID seems to increase the rates of mental health problems, uh, as well as uh, psychological distress. And there are at least four reasons for this. There's a direct impact of disease, uh, so uh, people who have a, a diagnosis of COVID have a 30% uh, chance of uh, getting a diagnosis of a mental health problem uh, thereafter. Um, there's also the fact that the disease kills people and therefore that increases grief and complex grief, which uh, is psychological issues. Um, uh, and uh, then, of course, there is... Um, uh, the uh, links between having a, a serious illness um, and serious illnesses sometimes increase people's um, uh, relapse of existing, uh, of existing uh, mental illnesses. So uh, there's a direct impact of disease. Then there are the impacts of the public health measures. Uh, if you, uh, from increased loneliness, social isolation, and then others uh, increase... Uh, impacts from, uh, uh, from lockdowns. So being locked down uh, with your family, uh, there's increased rates of domestic violence, increased rates of substance use, as well as uh, uh, other uh, factors which have come because of the uh, anxiety because of the public health measures. Then there's a question about availability of medical care. Uh, Decreased available of uh, cancer care has leads to anxiety. Interruption of other treatment can lead to worsening symptoms and uh, uh, psychological problems because of that. And if you have an existing mental health uh, issue and there's a decreased availability for your mental health treatment, that could increase uh, the likelihood of relapse. Uh, but one of the biggest factors 
um, on top of the public health measures uh, are the impacts of economic changes. Uh, so financial worry is a potent reason for increasing anxiety and depression. Uh, and uh, those, uh, the changes, the economic changes that there have been uh, and the economic uncertainty are linked to increases in mental health problems. So these ideas of a uh, echo pandemic uh, are linked to wellness problems, uh, languishing, stress, performance uh, difficulties and study at work, substance misuse with increased use of substances, interacting with toxic supply to increase opiate deaths, say for instance, and then new mental illness and a relapse from existing illnesses. Uh, and just to give you uh, just one uh, example of this, uh, this is the percentage of Canadians who say their mental wellness uh, has uh, been worse or substantially worse since the pandemic. And this is uh, data from August uh, 2020 through to April 2021. Uh, and uh, what we've got is just the dates at the end of these uh, different waves of uh, Statistics Canada uh, surveys. And you can see that by the time we've got to April with 42% of Canadians say their mental wellness is worse since the pandemic. And even though these things go up as we come into new waves of uh, COVID and they go down uh, as we go through the waves, they still, you know, even when they go down, we're still at 30% of people who say their mental wellness is worse since the pandemic, one in three people. And we have had a number of strategies to try and deal with this. But interestingly, all of the strategies have been about giving help or support to people when they have developed problems. So we've given online self-help, we've increased the number of helplines and crisis lines, we've increased access to online treatments such as cognitive behavioral therapy for depression and anxiety. Uh, we ourselves have had uh, different uh, public uh, uh, organizations come and say, you know, all of our staff are uh, dealing with people who are distressed all of the time. And so we've offered mental health literacy training, as have others like the Mental Health Commission of Canada and others, for public servants to try and help public servants be able to um, support people. Obviously, we've seen charities and third sector organisations increase their ability to do mental health supports, as we've seen some cities try and retool to give more men mental health supports. Uh, and there have been various strategies which have been developed uh, to treat problematic opioid use. Uh, mis uh, opioid use. Uh, and on top of that, um, with the increased amount of work, plus all of the stresses uh, in the hospital sector, we have also seen uh, increasing support for mental health service providers. So there's lots that's been done and lots of money that has been put into mental health, thinking about uh, what we need to do to improve mental health uh, during this pandemic. And as you know, there's government strategies that are being developed to increase the health transfer uh, to provinces and the mental health transfer to provinces to deal with this increased need. But there's a gap. And I flagged this right at the start. There's a gap and there's a gap in our pandemic strategy that we need to think about. Because we focused, focused on treatment of illness and we focus on support for distress, but we're not focused on wellness, psychological wellness. We haven't focused on building resilience and we haven't focused on stopping people getting ill. And when you're thinking about mental health promotion, you're thinking about what it is, building on strengths, 
building resilience. Um, you're thinking about uh, dealing with the social determinants of health. So making environments in which people can, can thrive. And you're talking about equity. Those are things we haven't focused on when we've started thinking about what we need in order to build a, a recovery, build a proper recovery. Because most of the needs that we have, the, the vast majority of needs that we have for, from a mental health perspective are not for people who are mentally ill. Now, we really do need more supports for people with mental illness and mental health disorders. We really do need a much more comprehensive system. But the pandemic has actually also grown. Uh, the number, one in three to one in four people who are distressed, but possibly the minority of them have a mental illness. And so going forward, when we're thinking about the recovery, when we're thinking about what people need, we need to think about mental health promotion. And other people have already been thinking about this. So early on in the pandemic, this is a book that was produced by the World Health Organization. And this is for children. And it's about uh, how they can protect themselves from coronavirus. But there's this whole section about how to manage difficult emotions when confronted with new and rapid changing realities. So how you can equip yourself to be resilient, what that looks like. Uh, there's actually pamphlets that were produced um, by the um, uh, WHO right back at 2019 um, to uh, think about this, about how kids respond to stress, what um, parents should think about, how parents should speak to children, even this idea of having routines uh, and uh, decreasing the amount of uh, negative news you take in uh, in order to build an environment for thriving. These things have been thought through. There's an evidence base in mental health promotion. And you've probably heard this idea of five a day, you can see on the right side, five a day of fruit and vegetables, which is your heart health. But there's also five a day for positive mental health. So if you want to be uh, have positive mental health, better mental uh, wellness and more resilience, they, they talk about doing five things. Connect, be active, be aware, get involved and give. Connect, stay connected with family and friends. And when they say connecting, texting, by the way, doesn't work as well as um, face to face uh, or Zoom or ringing somebody old fashioned on the phone. Uh, that works much better in making people feel connected and is much better for your mental resilience. Uh, exercise and being active, very good for your mental resilience. Be aware, mindfulness, gratitude, being able to enjoy everyday things, really, really important for your mental health. Get involved is actually about learning something new. Uh, so getting involved in a club, take a class, learn piano, do something. Yeah, that getting involved uh, changes your mind, builds your mind, builds your mental health resilience. And then last but not least, giving back to your community. Volunteering moves your brain into a different position completely. And it's really good for your mental resilience. So these five a day are individual things we can learn. But from a policy perspective, the question is, how do we promote them? How do we create policy environments that help people connect, that make it easy for people to be active, that make mindfulness more possible, that uh, promote getting involved and uh, continual learning and that allow people to volunteer and give back. 
how do we think that through? Why didn't we start thinking about giving people this sort of advice in the early stages of the pandemic to help people build resilience? Why didn't we give them opportunities to get involved in the pandemic in different ways so that rather than being, um, uh, being victims, you could be much more part of the, uh, of the solution. So there are all of these things that you can think about of how mental health promotion can link to, um, can, can link to a pandemic strategy. And we did one of the biggest uh, men, uh, mental health promotion uh, interventions ever. It's called the CERB. And there's quite a lot of evidence that that release of worry that was the CERB for low-income people, from people who'd lost their income, decreased the risk of mental health problems, anxiety, and depression in low-income people. And when the government starts thinking that way, not just we're giving money, but we're actually thinking about wellness and we're thinking about what we can do uh, to create wellness, then I think you get into a different way of thinking about a whole of government approach to wellness and mental health promotion. And some people are doing this. This is from Scotland. And you, you know, the, 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 I'll, I'll leave this um, online so that people can have it. It will be on the Wellesley website. But Scotland has something called the National Outcomes Framework. This is what Scotland is trying to work towards as a country, this is, this is its government's outcomes framework, and it is based on well-being. And it is specifically says it's based on well-being. It specifically says that the government is producing national outcomes built on the theory of well-being. It's actually a whole government approach to mental health promotion. Children and young people, wants them to realize their full potential. Communities, they want them to be inclusive, empowered, safe and resilient. A culture, they want it to be diverse, vibrant and enjoyed and expressed by everybody. They want their economy to be competitive, but inclusive and sustainable. They want people to be educated, but also able to use that education to contribute. They want to enjoy, protect and enhance their environment. They don't just want work, they want fair work in business and quality jobs. They want to be healthy, but active. They want to protect and fulfill uh, human rights so they can live in a non-discriminatory environment. Uh, they want a positive contribution internationally, and they want to decrease poverty by tackling increased inequities. And this seems aspirational, but they actually have 81 indicators to, so you can map uh, how they're doing. So not only is it words, but it's words with an actual measurement and transparency so you can see how your country is doing. And that whole fact of getting people to be part of the solution to be able to see the solution, to be able to work towards it and to understand what's happening uh, is part of the way you create a, uh, an environment where people can thrive. And so this is really interesting, what Scotland is doing. It's very interesting as a framework for mental health promotion. But we need our own. And so this is why a group of organizations spearheaded by the Wellesley have been arguing that we actually need to, re, when we rebuild, that we need a mentally healthy Canada. And so we have been talking about the need for a social contract for a mentally healthy Canada. We have um, you know, identified that um, uh, COVID-19 has exacerbated inequities uh, which were long present, but that the Canadian spirit 
is willing, ready and willing to overcome the new challenges. And we have to harness that spirit and uh, rebuild our society and uh, institutions in a coordinated way. We have highlighted the fact that uh, COVID-19 is a mental health emergency that requires an urgent response, but it needs to be a true social contract between all parties. So the public sector, civil society, the business society sector, all have to work together if we want to move forward. Um, and we want commitment. We think it's time for us as a society to commit uh, to a new agreement, maybe a 10 year mental wellness strategy, which is based on the theories of mental health promotion, which involves a government, civil society and business that focuses not just on mental illness and mental health, but mental wellness, which takes an equity approach, um, which includes people with lived experience in all aspects of the planning and delivery and really emphasizes resilience across all parts of our society and particularly for groups that need our help most. Um, and that means that we do actually need a mental health and wellness system that's funded uh, to adequate levels to meet uh, our needs. We need to focus on the workforce and the workplace and make sure that those workplaces keep us healthy. When we're thinking of substance misuse, we have to think of a comprehensive public health uh, approach to substance use policy. And we have to think about our children who are going through a difficult time at the moment. We have to think of their physical health. We have to think of their uh, mental health. We have to think about their emotional uh, safety. And we have to think about the social determinants of health because adverse childhood experiences are exquisitely linked to mental health and health outcomes in the future. And we have to think of things like poverty and chronic homelessness that we should get rid of now and uh, as an emergency if we're going to build uh, a better um, Canada going forward. So what we're saying with regards to mental health promotion is very much as we've been saying for other types of equity, there are things we're doing that we should do better and we should make sure that we do it in an equitable and effective way but we also need to look at the 85% of things which we have trouble with, which are the social, which lead uh, to us into trouble, which are the social determinants of health. And if we don't focus on the social determinants of health, if we don't focus on those social factors, if we don't focus on building on our um, uh, experience and our strengths, if we don't think about equity, um, and if we don't think about wellness and thriving, so if we don't think about mental health promotion, it's gonna be really difficult for us to rebuild and have a resilient population coming out of this pandemic. So it's simple to me, because when I was a kid, one of the things that after a while when you're sitting on the tube and you're hearing, mind the gap, mind the gap, mind the gap. It's really difficult not to sit there and think, why don't we fill in that gap? And that's what I'm suggesting that we need to think about for uh, mental health and therefore mental health promotion in COVID-19. Thank you very much. That concludes both keynote presentations. Lots of fodder for the online dialogue with Carol, Quam, and three other panelists at session 2B in the symposium program. Before you sign off, please take a few minutes to consider questions for the panelists and follow the link in the description below the video to submit your questions. 
All questions are welcome to clarify some of the points you heard, to build them out further, to add something new. Once you've submitted your questions, click Done Sharing and take a moment to rate a few of the questions posed by other participants. Easy, quick, and informative. The highest rated questions will be addressed during the panel. Sincere thanks for your preparation. We look forward to your participation in the panel discussion.